The Human Cycle by Sri Aurobindo Chapter 12 The Office and Limitations of the Reason This view of human life and of the process of our development to which subjectivism readily leads us gives us a truer vision of the place of the intellect in the human movement. We have seen that the intellect has a double working, dispassionate and interested, self-centered or subservient to movements not its own. The one is a disinterested pursuit of truth for the sake of truth and of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, without any ulterior motive, with every consideration put away except the rule of keeping the eye on the object, on the fact under inquiry, and finding out its truth, its process, its law. The other is colored by the passion for practice, the desire to govern life by the truth discovered, or the fascination of an idea which we labor to establish as the sovereign law of our life and action. We have seen indeed that this is the superiority of reason over the other faculties of man, that it is not confined to a separate absorbed action of its own, but plays upon all the others, discovers their law and truth, makes its discoveries serviceable to them, and even in pursuing its own bent and end, serves also their ends, and arrives at a Catholic utility. Man, in fact, does not live for knowledge alone. Life, in its widest sense, is his principal preoccupation, and he seeks knowledge for its utility to life much more than for the pure pleasure of acquiring knowledge. But it is precisely in this putting of knowledge at the service of life that the human intellect falls into that confusion and imperfection which pursues all human action. So long as we pursue knowledge for its own sake, there is nothing to be said. The reason is performing its natural function. It is exercising securely its highest right. In the work of the philosopher, the scientist, the savant, laboring to add something to the stock of our ascertainable knowledge, there is as perfect a purity and satisfaction as in that of the poet and artist creating forms of beauty for the aesthetic delight of the race. Whatever individual error and limitation there may be does not matter, for the collective and progressive knowledge of the race has gained the truth that has been discovered and may be trusted in time to get rid of the error. It is when it tries to apply ideas to life that the human intellect stumbles and finds itself at fault. Ordinarily, this is because in concerning itself with action, the intelligence of man becomes at once partial and passionate, and makes itself the servant of something other than the pure truth. But even if the intellect keeps itself as impartial and disinterested as possible, and altogether impartial, altogether disinterested, the human intellect cannot be unless it is content to arrive at an entire divorce from practice or a sort of 
large but ineffective tolerantism, eclecticism, or skeptical curiosity. Still, the truths it discovers, or the ideas it promulgates, become, the moment they are applied to life, the plaything of forces over which the reason has little control. Science, pursuing its cold and even way, has made discoveries which have served on one side a practical humanitarianism, on the other supplied monstrous weapons to egoism and mutual destruction. It has made possible a gigantic efficiency of organization which has been used on one side for the economic and social amelioration of the nations, and on the other, for turning each into a colossal battering ram of aggression, ruin, and slaughter. It has given rise, on the one side, to a large rationalistic and altruistic humanitarianism, on the other, it has justified a godless egoism, vitalism, vulgar will to power and success. It has drawn mankind together and given it a new hope and at the same time crushed it with the burden of a monstrous commercialism. Nor is this due as is so often asserted, to its divorce from religion or to any lack of idealism. Idealistic philosophy has been equally at the service of the powers of good and evil and provided an intellectual conviction both for reaction and for progress. Organized religion itself has often enough in the past, hounded men to crime and massacre, and justified obscurantism and oppression. The truth is that upon which we are now insisting, that reason in its nature, an imperfect light with a large but still restricted mission and that once it applies itself to life and action, it becomes subject to what it studies, and the servant and counselor of the forces in whose obscure and ill-understood struggle it intervenes. It can, in its nature, be used, and has always been used to justify any idea, theory of life, system of society or government, ideal or individual or collective action to which the will of man attaches itself for the moment or through the centuries. In philosophy, it gives equally good reasons for monism and pluralism or for any halting place between them for the belief in being or for the belief in becoming, for optimism and pessimism, for activism and quietism. It can justify the most mystic religionism and the most positive atheism. Get rid of God or see nothing else. In aesthetics, it supplies the basis equally for classicism and romanticism, for an idealistic, religious, or mystic theory of art, or for the most earthly realism. It can, with equal power, base austerely a strict and narrow moralism, or prove triumphantly the thesis of the antinomian. It has been the sufficient and convincing prophet of every kind of autocracy or oligarchy 
and of every species of democracy. It supplies excellent and satisfying reasons for competitive individualism and equally excellent and satisfying reasons for communism or against communism and for state socialism or for one variety of socialism against another. It can place itself with equal effectivity at the service of utilitarianism, economism, hedonism, aestheticism, sensualism, ethicism, idealism, or any other essential need or activity of man and build around it a philosophy, a political and social system, a theory of conduct and life. Ask it not to lean to one idea alone, but to make an eclectic combination or a synthetic harmony, and it will satisfy you. Only there being any number of possible combinations or harmonies, it will equally well justify the one or the other and set up or throw down any one of them according as the spirit in man is attracted to or withdraws from it. For it is really that which decides, and the reason is only a brilliant servant and minister of this veiled and secret sovereign. This truth is hidden from the rationalist because he is supported by two constant articles of faith. First, that his own reason is right, and the reason of others who differ from him is wrong. And secondly, that whatever may be the present deficiencies of the human intellect, the collective human reason will eventually arrive at purity and be able to found human thought and life securely on a clear, rational basis entirely satisfying to the intelligence. His first article of faith is no doubt the common expression of our egoism and arrogant fallibility, but it is also something more. It expresses this truth that is the legitimate function of the reason to justify to man his action and his hope and the faith that is in him and to give him that idea and knowledge, however restricted, and that dynamic conviction, however narrow and intolerant, which he needs in order that he may live, act, and grow in the highest light available to him. The reason cannot grasp all truth in its embrace, because truth is too infinite for it. But still, it does grasp the something of it which we immediately need, and its insufficiency does not detract from the value of its work, but is rather the measure of its value. For man is not intended to grasp the whole truth of his being at once, but to move towards it through a succession of experiences and a constant, though not by any means a perfectly continuous, self-enlargement. The first business of reason, then, is to justify and enlighten to him his various experiences, and to give him faith and conviction in holding on to his self-enlargings. It justifies to him now this, now that, the experience of the moment, the receding light of the past, the half-seen vision of the future. Its inconstancy, its divisibility against itself, its power of sustaining opposite views, 
are the whole secret of its value. It would not do indeed for it to support two conflicting views in the same individual, except at moments of awakening and transition. But in the collective body of men and in the successions of time, that is its whole business. For so man moves towards the infinity of the truth by the experience of its variety. So his reason helps him to build, change, destroy what he has built, and prepare a new construction. In a word, to progress, grow, enlarge himself in his self-knowledge and world-knowledge and their works. The second article of faith of the believer in reason is also an error and yet contains a truth. The reason cannot arrive at any final truth because it can neither get to the root of things nor embrace the totality of their secrets. It deals with the finite, the separate, the limited aggregate, and has no measure for the all and the infinite. Nor can reason found a perfect life for man or a perfect society. A purely rational human life would be a life balked and deprived of its most powerful dynamic sources. It would be a substitution of the minister for the sovereign. A purely rational society could not come into being and, if it could be born, either could not live or would sterilize and petrify human existence. The root powers of human life, its intimate causes, are below, irrational, and they are above, super-rational. But this is true, that by constant enlargement, purification, openness, the reason of man is bound to arrive at an intelligent sense, even of that which is hidden from it, a power of passive yet sympathetic reflection of the light that surpasses it. Its limit is reached, its function is finished, when it can say to man, there is a soul, a self, a God in the world, and in man who works concealed, and all is his self-concealing and gradual self-unfolding. His minister I have been, slowly to unseal your eyes, remove the thick integuments of your vision, until there is only my own luminous veil between you and him. Remove that and make the soul of man one in fact and nature with this divine. Then you will know yourself, discover the highest and widest law of your being, become the possessors or at least the receivers and instruments of a higher will and knowledge than mine, and lay hold at last on the true secret and the whole sense of a human and yet divine living.